Hello girls and boys. Welcome back to yet another faith online video session. We continue our study of the kingdom history of the Israelites, moving on to the third of the kings that is the wise Solomon. So far, we were referring to the first and the second books of Samuel from the Bible as we talked about Saul and then David. And now we move on to the first book of Kings. But before we move to Solomon, let's pause to look at our national emblem, the Ashoka Pillar Capital. A few sessions ago, we spoke about the 26th of January when we gave ourselves a constitution. The sacred book of India was etched with this national emblem adopted on that same day. You see it in all the official documents and places. Do you know the meaning of this national emblem? It is an adaptation of the top part of the Ashoka pillar at Sarnath. In the original, there are four lions back to back mounted on a topmost disc with the figures of a horse, a bull, an elephant and a lion. Now remember the last two, that is the elephant and the lion, are not seen in the emblem, separated by the intervening wheels or chakras. The capital is crowned by the wheel of the law, that is the dharma chakra, and supported on the heads of the lions. In the state emblem, only three lions are visible on the top, and only the horse and bull on the abacus. The words Satyameva Jayate from the Munkada Upanishadad meaning truth alone triumphs are inscribed below the abacus in Devanagari script. Why do you think the founding fathers of our nation decided to choose Ashoka as the person to give inspiration to the whole newborn country? Perhaps because he was the best king in the entire history of India. In his kingdom, there was unity. He ruled over a vast empire as one kingdom. There was peace. His edicts were transcribed on such huge pillars in various parts of the empire and followed by the people. In his kingdom, there was prosperity. He dedicated himself to the material and spiritual welfare of the people. In his kingdom, there was tolerance. As a result of the violent wars in his earlier days, he converted to Buddhism and preached non-violence and tolerance. Take a few seconds to reflect if you think that Indians today have allowed themselves to be truly inspired by Ashoka. Was it worthwhile having chosen the Ashoka Pillar Capital as a national emblem? Let us now move on to see how the people of Israel were impressed by one of their greatest kings, King Solomon. We take a step back to look at how King David, knowing that there would be rival claimants to his throne after his death, decided to choose while he was still alive Solomon, his youngest son, as his successor. He arranged for the prophets Zado and Nathan to anoint Solomon as king of Israel and Judah. Yet, when Solomon actually ascended to the throne, there happened to be a bloodbath as he was forced to squash those enemies of the court who disproved of him. On the whole, the reign of Solomon was a period of great peace and prosperity marked by a well-organized government, growth in foreign trade, and neighboring nations paying tribute money to Israel. One particularly important incident in the first years of Solomon's reign occurred at Gibeon, where he had gone to offer sacrifices to the Lord. There he had a vision of God speaking to him, What should I give you? Solomon asked for the gift of wisdom to rule his people with justice and to know the difference between good and evil. 
God was extremely pleased that Solomon had not asked for material benefits like long life, wealth, or power. God granted him wisdom and understanding more than anyone had before or would ever have again. And this was proved in a famous judgment scene in the king's court. Two women came to court with a dispute over a dead infant. It seems that these women both had given birth to new babies at about the same time. One of these babies happened to die during the night and both the women claimed to be the mother of the living baby. The king observed the women very closely and sensed that not one of the two was unable to accept the death of her own babe, jealous of the other mother whose baby was alive. Solomon commanded the women to stop arguing and calling for one of his soldiers, asked him to divide the living child into two and to give one half to one woman and the second half to the other. One woman immediately said, Please don't kill the baby, give it to her. And the other woman replied, Don't give it to either of us, go on and cut it into two. Thus it was clear in the eyes of all who was the true mother. And Solomon restored to her the living baby. The people of Israel just marveled that God had given Solomon such wisdom to settle disputes fairly and his fame spread far and wide. Solomon made the administration of his kingdom more efficient by dividing the whole territory into 12 districts fairly equal in population and crop production which did not all correspond to the traditional tribal divisions. Each district had officers in charge responsible for collecting food from farmers and shepherds to maintain Solomon's court's needs for one month of every year. Solomon introduced the practice of forced labor away from home to maintain his many building projects, the royal palace, the temple, fortification of the cities and ports, granaries and storehouses for food and other material. This new practice was not liked by his people used to a life of fields and flocks. Still another change Solomon introduced in his foreign trade policy. No longer was trade left to individual merchants but was managed by the king's officers. He constructed a fleet of ships with the help of Hiram, the king of Tyre, and the Phoenician shipbuilders and sailors. This fleet traded with southern Arabia and East Africa and even brought back items from India, ivory, precious stones, and live monkeys. Solomon also traded in war chariots and developed horse breeding. The extensive commerce brought riches to many Israelites and a wealthy upper class was slowly emerging to Solomon's administrative reforms. We must recall how detailed law codes written in the book of Exodus dealt with social justice for the people. The law protected the most defenseless members among the Jews, the poor and marginalized, the widows and orphans, the maimed and the strangers. Now with so much wealth enjoyed by the upper classes in Solomon's court and civil services, people forgot the law codes of justice and concern. The poor and helpless lower classes, that is the shepherds and the farmers, were often treated with contempt and were forcibly recruited for labor. Corruption in the court led to violence and even shedding of innocent blood. For the first time, a noticeable gap appeared between the upper richer class and the common poor in Israel. The prophets protested loudly against this lack of concern and injustice. King Solomon built friendly and diplomatic relations with other countries to the extent of even marrying one of the daughters of Pharaoh of Egypt, unusual for a king of Israel. The Bible tells a legendary story about the Queen of Sheba, that is an ancient country in the Arabian Peninsula, 
who hearing of the wisdom and riches of Solomon, decided to visit him in his royal palace in Jerusalem. Solomon welcomed this foreign dignitary with great pomp and splendor, arranging for her to travel about in his kingdom to see his projects and the organization of his government. Then she tested his wisdom about which she had heard so much, asked riddles on a number of subjects, but just couldn't outwit the king. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the reports I heard, said the queen, and she departed from Israel with an exchange of gifts. The queen gave gold, precious stones and perfumes, while Solomon asked her to choose what she most desired. Solomon was the most powerful ruler in the area, stretching from the Euphrates to Egypt. His reign remembered in the history of Israel as the Golden Age enjoyed a special love and protection from God. During Solomon's reign, the unified kingdom of Israel with its capital in Jerusalem reached the height of its splendor and glory. Even then, there lurked an undercurrent of discontent and rivalry among the tribes. The powerful tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh in the north felt resentment towards Judah, the tribe of the royal family. These tribal rivalries added to heavy taxes and forced labor, eventually paving the way for a split or division in the people of Israel. I invite you to take up a prayerful posture, to gently close your eyes and pay attention to your breathing as you breathe in and very slowly breathe out. In the silence of our hearts, we reflect on how Solomon prayed for the gift of wisdom to rule his people with justice and to know the difference between good and evil. God granted him this precious gift and the wisdom of Solomon was collected in a separate book in the Old Testament that is the book of Proverbs. Solomon, it is said, composed 3,000 proverbs and more than a thousand songs. As we continue to remain silent, let us listen to some of his wise sayings which are relevant for us today. A reading from the book of Proverbs Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Good sense makes a man slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook an offence. There is gold and abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. You may have noticed these proverbs give us ways of dealing with life's situations. Do you agree with the wisdom Solomon gives us? Or do you feel it is outdated for modern life? Take a few minutes to reflect on these proverbs as we continue to keep our eyes closed. Girls and boys, I now invite you to gently open your eyes and let me share the instructions for our assignment for this week. In India, we showed our appreciation of King Ashoka by choosing his pillars as our national emblem. Now imagine if we were to pick up King Solomon as our inspiration, what sort of an emblem would you make? 
We invite you to create an emblem that reminds us of the golden age of the people of Israel under Solomon. Also, tell us how this emblem of Solomon would compare with that of the Ashoka Pillar Capital. Be as creative as possible with your artwork and your writings. And don't forget to send us the scanned images of your artwork, of your writings by Thursday evening. So girls and boys, I am sure if you had not heard of King Solomon and his greatness, his wisdom, his judgment before today, now you are more familiar. We cannot but help having a great admiration for Solomon as a wise, efficient and far-seeing statesman ahead of his times in establishing diplomatic relations with neighboring countries in order to make his rule the golden age of Israel. We do continue to study about Solomon's temple in the following lesson. But for now, that is all we have for you today. Have a lovely day ahead and an even better week. Stay safe and stay blessed.